In his 1924 presidential campaign, Calvin Coolidge greeted the emotional subject of prohibition at press conferences with a standard response, no comment. No matter how insistent the questioning reporters, he steadfastly persisted in his no comment. Then he would leave the room, and smiling ever so slightly, he would add, now don't quote me. <laughs> Calvin Coolidge hardly stands out in our national history as a bright and shining example of presidential leadership and power. His laid-back style and renowned nap-taking are the few legacies of his presidency. However, Coolidge did seem to understand that no response is sometimes the wisest response we can make to a situation that transcends human insight or experience. Today is the last Sunday of the Epiphany season, and our gospel lesson is Mark's version of the Transfiguration. The evangelist Mark sets the story of the Transfiguration six days after Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. In Mark's Gospel, when Peter acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus then begins to try to teach his disciples about his future suffering and death. And Peter tries to dissuade Jesus that that need be the case. Jesus rebukes Peter by saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. When the whole event is over, Jesus issues a kind of gag order. He orders them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. If anyone asks, they are to say, no comment. Why? Well, first of all, they weren't ready yet. Peter, James, and John, along with the rest of the disciples, were akin to the not-yet-ready-for-prime-time players. They didn't get it yet. What didn't they get? Basically, the kind of Messiah Jesus was and the good news about that. The Gospel writer Mark, even as he tells us the story, is indicating that the disciples aren't there yet. Mark places his telling of the story of the Transfiguration right in the middle of the midsection of his Gospel. The story of the Transfiguration of Mark, in Mark is bookended by two other stories, Jesus healing a blind man in Mark 8, and Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus in Mark 10. In between these two stories, the disciples themselves are blind. Jesus says three different times that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. But the disciples, exemplified by Peter, do not understand this. Over and over, Mark lifts up both aspects of Jesus' identity, relentlessly recalling that the suffering will yield to triumph, but that the triumph cannot be had without the price of the cross. The combination of glory and suffering lies at the heart of Mark's gospel. 
But at this point in the gospel, at the scene of the transfiguration, the disciples don't get it. I have a friend who calls them the 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 disciples. They aren't yet ready to speak of God's glory because they aren't yet ready to deal with God's suffering. If they are asked, Jesus orders no comment. Secondly, they need to listen more. After Peter's babbling stopped, a cloud overshadowed them, and a divine voice said, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. We would all do well to listen more not just to the cacophony of voices that threatens to make the whole world go deaf, but to Jesus, the Christ, God's beloved child. We begin our lives listening to the many sounds surrounding us in the womb. When we are dying, the last faculty to shut down is usually hearing. In between, there is so much to see that we seldom take the time to cultivate the art of listening. Listening involves other practices, paying attention, being present, openness to hearing. It is a holy work involving, in the inventive phrase of W.A. Matthew, a Sufi musician, making an altar out of our ears. Making an altar out of our ears. As a spiritual discipline, listening has been commended by mystics and theologians throughout the ages. Hear... O Israel, is the central command of Hebrew scripture. Benedict of Nursia, founder of the Benedictine religious order, advised his followers, listen, my children, with the ear of your heart. Quakers have long been practitioners of silence and cultivators of good listening. Quaker writer Douglas Steer said this, holy listening, to listen another's soul into life, into a condition of disclosure and discovery, may be almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. This kind of listening is life-giving. Christians are challenged to listen to the word of God and particularly to Jesus, the Christ. But we, in common with the disciples in today's gospel lesson, sometimes want to have the glory that we can see without the message that we must hear and the two cannot be separated. As readers of Mark's gospel, we could position ourselves over against the disciples, critical of them in their confusion, doubt, and cowardice, or we could identify with the disciples and bow over this text, indicted, penitent, and forgiven. It is not easy to resist the offer of a gospel of success, an invitation into what Reinhold Niebuhr once described as a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. The divine voice says, this is my son, the beloved. Listen, to him. A third reason for Jesus' gag order to the disciples after the transfiguration 
is that sometimes no comment is the very best response. Perhaps the greatest master of the no comment response was not Calvin Coolidge, but Jesus himself. His ministry was a mastery of understatement. His message was communicated in parables. His mission was cloaked in commonness. The temptation of Christ is usually defined as that period of wilderness wanderings following Jesus' baptism that we will honor next week at the first Sunday in Lent. Yet it was at the conclusion of Jesus' ministry on earth that Jesus was confronted with what was surely one of the greatest temptations of his life. Arrested and hauled before the Sanhedrin and then the Roman authorities, Jesus was given numerous opportunities to explain away his actions and attitudes. Having wrestled with his doubts at Gethsemane, Jesus remained obedient to the unfathomable will of God, to the mystery of the impending crucifixion and resurrection by maintaining a consistent no comment in the face of the apparently reasonable requests by the authorities to explain himself. To me, the most dramatic confrontation in the whole Bible occurs between Jesus and Pilate in John's Gospel. Withstanding the temptation to put God's plans for him into words, Jesus stands before Pilate in silence, following Pilate's incredible question, what is truth? Jesus' ultimately deadly no comment to Pilate was the most eloquent response he could have given. Through his silence, the majesty and mystery of God's grace was allowed to happen in the drama on Golgotha, leaving Pilate with the distinct impression that he might not know the truth even if it were standing right in front of him, face to face. So, today, we celebrate the transfiguration of Jesus, the Christ, Son of the living God. The glory of God is revealed to us in dramatic story and song. The power of God is clear, and the ultimate victory of God is evident. But before we babble out, the gospel of success, let us stop and ask ourselves, do we really get it? Do we understand that the Son of Man must suffer and be crucified? Do we really see the face of Christ in those who suffer? Are we listening what is God saying to us? We will begin the season of Lent this week. Let us consider the possibility of no comment as a way of stilling the noisiness within us, that we may be still and know that God is God. Amen.